And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mattis and Megan Anderson. I'll bring it to you. Come on up, guys. Well, we just want to thank everybody for coming out. It's early in the morning, and I remember when I first presented um, at this meeting, probably, I was trying to think back to when it was, maybe eight or nine years ago, there were maybe as many people are as in this middle row. So it's great to see this many people interested in WM and wanting to learn about it. So I've worked with Dr. Mattis for, this is the 13th year, and his passion for WM has sort of become my passion for WM. We have lots of patients with it in Denver, and I think that our perspective is really one of wanting to educate patients so that when you are looking at your labs and talking to your physicians and your nurse practitioners or your PAs, that you understand the biology, you understand sort of the framework for it. So our presentation is sort of coming from that perspective so that when you're really having conversations, you know the basics. So we're gonna talk about um, sort of the, the biology of Waldenstrom's. We're going to talk about when it occurs and um, who develops this disease and then kind of go through how the diagnosis is made, the symptoms that patients have, and, and a very sort of basic review of treatment guidelines. Most of the treatment information will come later in the day. So as most of you guys already know, WM is a blood cancer. I think it's hard to wrap your mind around a blood cancer in general because if you have a patient, or if you're a patient, or if you have a family member with breast cancer, for example, you can visualize that. You can understand that that's a cancer of a bunch of cells in the breast that makes a tumor, and that's pretty easy to understand. I think with WM, it's harder because which cell causes the cancer? Where is the cancer living? How is it dividing? It's, it's much more difficult, in my mind, to sort of wrap your head around. So we have some pictures in this presentation that I think will help sort of to give you a visual of what exactly WM is. But with all cancers, um, our cells are supposed to live a certain amount of time in our body, and then they're supposed to die off. That's called programmed cell death. Um, so programmed cell death is supposed to occur at a certain defined period of time, and in most cancers, that doesn't happen, and the cells go on to live and indefinitely or for a longer amount of time than they should. Additionally, the body, the cells are being programmed to make excess number of cells. In the case of WM, these cells also make an extra antibody called IgM. So you have too many of the actual WM cells, and then you have too many of the WM proteins, which are the IgM proteins. And we'll speak a little bit more in a couple of slides about how these proteins cause symptoms. It was named after um, a, a Swedish oncologist named Jan Waldenstrom, first identified in 1944. Here's his picture, which some of you may be familiar with. Has, have any, has anybody in this room seen a diagram similar to this? Does it look familiar at all? So this is um, a diagram of, of the way blood cells are made in our body. And I usually use the analogy with my patients that the bone marrow is kind of like a garden. So our, our bone marrow cells, our stem cells, are made in our breastbone, our sternum, and in our pelvis bone. And all of the stems, all of the cells in the, in the bone marrow start out as stem cells. Those are like the, the seeds or the baby cells. And then they, as they differentiate, as they grow into the three types of white blood cells, that's when people can develop blood cancers. So the three different types of cells in the blood that our bodies are supposed to make, the three main types, are the platelets, the red cells, and then all of these cells on this side are, are types of white blood cells. So as our stem cells are differentiating, down in this sort of area here, as B cells, lymphocytes are turning into plasma cells, this is the area where Waldenstrom's develops. So it's this exact cell that becomes cancerous. This cancer is rare, as many of you know, so only three in a million people per year. It's a disease of older people. The average age of diagnosis is 64. It happens in men more than women and in Caucasians more than other races. And in approximately 20% of cases, there's a familial um, risk or a, a familial association. So how do, who determines or how do we determine like what is, a, what is WM versus another type of cancer? And in order to standardize this, physicians get together and they come up with classification systems that say, okay, in order to call this 
disease, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, what things have to be present. And in the case of WM, you have to have certain types of cells in the bone marrow, which we'll talk about here in a minute, but those cells are lymphoplasmacytic cells. And, and this is the important part, you have to have the presence of an IgM protein in the blood. So it's possible to have what's called a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma that makes an IgG protein instead of an IgM protein, and that's not WM, that's a, a different blood cancer that we also see. I think it's less common than WM, but it's definitely a possibility. But in order to have WM, you must have the IgM protein. Then it's important to distinguish whether or not the WM, the, the abnormal cells, are causing problems. So you can have lots of these WM cells in the bone marrow, and you may feel like a million bucks. You might have normal labs, you don't have any symptoms, and in that case, we would determine that you're asymptomatic. You have no symptoms from the disease. Versus if the cells and the proteins are making you feel unwell or making the blood counts drop, then we would determine that that's symptomatic disease, it's making you sick, and it's important to, to, to differentiate the two because if you have symptomatic disease, you need to be treated, and if you have asymptomatic disease, then you can be monitored without treatment, without chemotherapy. How many have, have you guys have heard of MGUS or maybe had MGUS before you found out you had WM? Let's say that's probably, I see maybe four hands raised or so, five? More? Okay. Weren't high enough. Um, so MGUS is a, a precursor disease to different types of cancer. And some, MGUS is basically just an abnormal protein that's identified in the blood. And in approximately one or two percent of people per year, it will turn into a type, some type of cancer. So it can turn into multiple myeloma or Waldenstrom's. And so many patients with WM, if they you know, look, if you look, could look back at the blood, you may see the presence of this protein long before the disease of WM was made, the diagnosis of WM was made. So most um, WM cases are completely random and sporadic. If patients ask us what causes it, as with a lot of cancers, we just tell them it's, it's just bad luck. However, in WM, there's about a 20% risk that it can be familial and passed down within families. How many people in this room have a family member with, with WM? What about another type of blood cancer? Okay. And we talked about the main risk factor being the presence of MGUS, and this percentage here is actually wrong. It should be 2%, not 10%. So um, when looking at kind of what types of cancer are associated with the presence of WM, this graph uh, this pie chart gives us a little bit of an idea. So this is patients with WM, approximately 81% of them have no family history of blood cancer. And then you can see the smattering, this other 20% of the pie chart is kind of a smorgasbord of other blood cancers. WM, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, multiple myeloma, CLL, MGUS. So when I first started working with Dr. Madison, sort of speaking to patients and trying to do education, I think the thing that I had the hardest time understanding was to try to visualize this M protein and to try to understand, or this IgM, try to understand why it causes trouble. So I think looking at, um, talking about the quantitative immunoglobulins and the IgM, and in the next slide I'll show you a picture, helps us to understand why, do, why does this protein cause problems. So when we're looking at um, patients with, with WM, like I said, you have to have this M spike. So one test, that one blood test that we measure is a test called the quantitative immunoglobulins. And it measures the IgA, IgM, and IgG. And those are all antibodies that are a normal part of the immune system that help our body to fight infection. In patients with WM, the IgM number is high, and usually the other two, the IgG and the IgA, are low. And that's one of the reasons why you can be at an increased risk for infection when you have WM. So a normal IgG protein is this one um, compound of a heavy chain right here, which is the long part, and then these two little um, pieces attached to it, which are called light chains. And light chains have names like kappa, and lambda. 
The thing about an IgM protein, which is different than, for example, an IgG protein, is it actually is five um, pieces attached to each other, making the protein heavy and large. And so if you have a bunch of these that accumulate in the bloodstream, then it can increase the thickness of the blood. And we'll talk about um, serum viscosity and how that can cause symptoms here in just a minute. So when the Mayo Clinic kind of did an evaluation, and again, this is patients who are being referred in from, you know, there's a little bit of referral bias by the time you're winding up in the Mayo Clinic, but they wanted to kind of look to see of all the patients that have these abnormal protein problems, kind of what's the distribution of those patients. And so if, like I said before, if you have an elevated protein in the bloodstream, it may not be a problem at all. It may just be the same called MGUS, which is a precursor to cancer, which needs to be monitored, but may not actually be, um, may not actually be a cancerous issue. So at the Mayo Clinic, when these patients were referred in with abnormal proteins, about 50% of them have, had MGUS, 20% had myeloma, and then the rest were other more rare blood cancers that we see. And you can see that of all the patients with these abnormal protein problems, only 3% had WM. Okay, so we're, we're going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about uh, uh, other tests that you have done. So uh, one common misconception among physicians is that, that a physician can make a diagnosis of WM <coughs> doing a bone marrow biopsy, and that's patently false. So if you've been told that you have WM without having had a bone marrow biopsy performed, then that is incorrect. So the standard of care is to pour, perform a bone marrow biopsy because as Megan pointed out, uh, to make, in order to make a proper diagnosis of WM, two factors are required. One of those is you have to have the IgM monoclonal protein present in your blood. And the second thing is you have to have those abnormal lymphoplasmacytic cells, we call them LPL cells, present in the bone marrow biopsy. So not the most fun procedure for patients to undergo, but uh, it is required in order to make the correct diagnosis. So when we do a bone marrow biopsy, and look at it, what is it the doctor is see, doctors see? This is a pretty typical uh, uh, bone marrow biopsy report. And it's one of many slides that I have obtained over the years from, from Steve Treon. And I'll tell you how Steve got me into WM in a few minutes. Uh, and anyway, I'm going to try to hit the pointer button here. And we're going to go over here. Since Megan was working on the left side and then your left, I'm going to work on the right. So typically what you see is you see uh, um, cells that are abnormal lymphocyte cells, LPL, lympho, lymphocyte plasmacytic, lymphoplasmacytic. And you see these uh, small to intermediate sized lymphocytes, plasma cells, and lymphoplasmacytoid forms. This is a very, very, very common bone marrow biopsy report in WM. And, and there's often these other funny cells that hang around the LPL cells called mast cells. So if you've ever looked at your bone marrow biopsy report or had your doctor try to explain it to you, this is very typical. Now, believe it or not, until not very long ago, when this type of bone marrow biopsy report was obtained, the, typically the pathologist would say underneath it, uh, this is a lymphoma and it could be either something called Waldenstrom's or WM, but it could be something else. It could be a marginal zone lymphoma. Perhaps some of you were told you had marginal, marginal zone lymphoma or had that. And people actually, people being doctors, actually queried for a long period of time if WM really was a separate disease from the other stuff or it was just a variation of marginal, marginal zone lymphoma or other lymphomas. And so and it wasn't until all the fancy DNA testing and genetic testing of these cells uh, uh, was really understood that everyone uh, accepted the fact that WM really is its own special lymphoma, which is why you get your own special support group and your own special meeting. So th this is a very typical uh, report that you get uh, in that setting. So this is what the bone marrow biopsy looks like to doctors when you look at their microscope. And, and when I was learning how to look at bone marrow biopsies uh, growing up in my career, uh, I was told that blue is bad. Uh, and so they, they usually look blue under a microscope, they're a little purplish here. But all these cells are more or less identical to each other. Usually when you do a bone marrow biopsy, you see a lot of cells that, that there's a lot of mix of cells. Remember Megan showed you that one slide of all those, the stem cells and the white cells and the red cells and the platelets? Usually when you look at a bone marrow biopsy, there's a wonderful mix of all these cells. 
But often in lymphoma, what one sees is you have, it's, it's a, predominant, a predominance of one kind of cell, which is very evident for all of us to see here, even those who, of us who have never looked at a bone marrow biopsy before. So, so what are symptoms of WM? Remember Megan talked about uh, just because you have LPL cells in your bone marrow and IgM in your blood, that's WM, doesn't mean that you have symptoms. You may have what's called smoldering disease. And is, is anyone here a smolderer? Yeah, there's usually a fair number of smolderers. And smolderers, uh, uh, that means you, you're minding your own business and somebody drew your blood, and then you end up getting referred to a hematologist, uh, and then you got a bone marrow biopsy done, and they're, they're giving you the name of a diagnosis that you, these, please write that down, right? Uh, WM. And so smoldering patients, uh, by definition, don't have any problem from the disease. Their risk of progression to WM is about 12% for the first five years. And then if you have smoldering disease and you haven't progressed to symptomatic disease in the first five years, your risk of progressing actually starts to decline. So smolders, the longer you go, the longer you go. That's what we always tell the smolders. What are symptoms that determine symptomatic disease? What might my patients complain about? Well, um, and of those of you who have symptomatic disease, how about number one here, weakness and fatigue. Uh, by far and away, I think, the most common symptom that we see with WM. And this is a very, very difficult symptom to sort out sometimes for people with WM because weakness and fatigue, I mean, who doesn't have tiredness? And, and it's really hard, especially when you're following a patient you think may be asymptomatic. And they say, I'm tired, to determine, well, is that due to the WM or not? It's, it can be very, very, very difficult to sort that out. And one of the things that we've seen in our practice is that people who have been followed for a long period of time for smoldering disease who get tired, uh, even the patients themselves don't really want to say, yeah, I think I'm tired because of WM. They, they, you start to talk yourself out of it. But by far and away, fatigue is the most common symptom. Hemorrhagic manifestation, what on earth is that? So hemorrhagic manifestation means uh, bleeding or bruising. And there's no question that people with WM, some, have more bleeding and bruising than others. Uh, unintentional weight loss, and usually if, I ask, if we ask a patient about unintentional weight loss, they always say, I wish, uh, but uh, we normally don't like that. Neurologic symptoms, that can be peripheral neuropathy, for example, numbness, tingling in your fingers or your toes. Visual disturbances, and that can occur, of course, if you have thickness of the blood called hyperviscosity that, that, that interferes with your eye's ability to, to see normally. And there's something called Raynaud's phenomenon as well, where people go out in cold weather, for example, and their fingers turn white, and they can really have to wear gloves all the time. And we're going to delve into these some more. I want to step back for a second and make a point here about WM that Megan and I always make when we see our patients. And, and, and if you look around the room, all you people have WM or know someone who does, but the odds are pretty good that no two of you have WM behaving in the exact same way. So the, 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 the way that this disease affects patients varies tremendously from patient to patient. So your experience might be completely different from the person next to you who has WM. And we have certain patients who have all these, all these, and every symptom you can have with WM, we have other patients who just have a little bit of fatigue or a little bit of anemia. So just keep that in mind. Not everyone has all these things, and some, people, some people's disease pick and chooses between these. So let's talk about the question. Do you include mental confusion and memory stuff under neurologic? Yeah, so under neurologic, the question is, do we include mental confusion and memory stuff? And memory is really hard. It's a hard one to tie into WM, but mental confusion certainly can happen if you have something called hyperviscosity, which is when motor oil runs through your blood instead of, you know, 40 weight motor oil is going through your vessels instead of normal blood. But we'll talk about that in a few slides down the road. So, so people get, why do people get symptoms from WM? Well, there are a few reasons why that happens. And I, I, I have a couple slides on this. One is you can have what's called tumor infiltration. And, and so over here at the very top says tumor infiltration. What is that? Tumor infiltration is when you have those LPL cells, those lymphoma cells, taking over more and more and more of the bone marrow or causing lymph nodes to swell with lymphoma or the spleen, which sits under the left, the left rib cage here to swell with lymphoma. And so you can have symptoms just by virtue of the fact that you have more 
pounds of lymphoma in your body, and that can cause certain symptoms that we'll look at in a little bit here. However, you can also get symptoms from that IgM protein. So you can have relatively small numbers of lymphoma cells in your bone marrow, but sometimes the IgM protein that it makes is nefarious enough that it'll go out there and make you sick. So you can have problems from just having too many pounds of uh, lymphoma or from the IgM protein. And sometimes that IgM protein can actually go in and irritate the nerves directly as well. So we'll, we'll address this again in a few slides. And this is a great slide. This is very commonly, this slide makes its way into virtually every WM uh, talk, talk ever. And so I'm going to give uh, from two docs, uh, Steve Trion and, and John Parley Merlini. And I'm going to tell you how Dr. Trion got me into to WM. So there's a, a very brutal uh, blood cancer conference that occurs in Whistler, BC uh, during ski season. It, it's, 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 not, it's, hard, it's hard to suffer through that conference. But, the, uh, but I was on a bus from Vancouver to, to BC, and I was just, and there's this guy behind me, we were just chatting, chatting, chatting. He says, well, what do you do? I said, well, we work in Colorado, and we do this, and, and, and he tells me what he, he does, and he does sees WM patients all day and all night in Boston. Uh, and, and I said, well, we, we have a lot of WM patients in Colorado, it seems like. And it was Steve, and so Steve said, well, if you have a lot of patients, why don't you, uh, think about joining our WM clinical trials group, and that must have been 10, 15, 15 years ago or whatever. And so ever since then, we've been hooked in the uh, WM crowd officially. So, so again, looking at this, let's look here. This is another uh, example of a bone marrow. And, and we can see in this bone marrow, for those of you who are advanced in pathology, that these, these, these uh, cells right here are more lymphoplasmacytic. And these ones here look more like a myeloma cell or a plasma cell. So this is, where, this is a very typical thing where you get lymphoplasmacytic disease. And so if you, um, if you have a lot of this in your bone marrow, and then you can get swelling of the, you get uh, occupation of the bone marrow, swelling of the lymph nodes, swelling of the spleen. And then, you, and then also these lymphoma cells uh, make things, make substances that make us not feel well sometimes. And these are called cytokines. And they can cause fatigue, tiredness, sweating, particularly at nighttime. And, and this isn't a very common symptom of WM, but I would wager that some of you, before you were diagnosed, noticed that you were having maybe low grade temperatures at nighttime or sweating episodes at nighttime uh, that were not menopausal, uh, for example. And so, so that, that, can, that occurs in, in WM. And then the WM can cause something called uh, IgM neuropathy. And then there's these really weird things here called cryoglobulinemia, and everyone's going to have to be able to pronounce that to go to any, any of the subsequent sessions today, or cold agglutinemia. These are very rare, but, the, but we have a patient who just has a textbook case of this in Colorado. What happens is that the IgM uh, uh, forms a complex, something in, in your body, that when you go out in cold weather, it just says to your blood, don't flow properly, quit flowing, clog things up. What people get is they get purplish uh, uh, digits sometimes, or their ears can turn purple, or sometimes the tips of their nose can turn purple when this happens, and it's dramatic when it happens. So our patient in particular likes to ride his Harley. And so we can always, we, we don't even need to draw his blood to know how he's doing. We just ask him if he can ride his Harley without, uh, at, at cooler times of the year without his fingers turning purple or his ears turning purple. And if he can, he's fine. And if they turn purple, we have to treat them. And so uh, that's called, this is unusual, but it's dramatic when it happens. Dramatic when it happens. And then there's this thing called hyperviscosity. And hyperviscosity is when you have so much IgM in your blood, so much IgM in your blood. This is more common in older people with WM than younger people, uh, that you get uh, nosebleeds, headaches, your vision's not good, you can get confused, you're not as sharp as you normally are. And that's a pretty dramatic thing as well, hyperviscosity. And sometimes when people are first diagnosed, they get diagnosed because of hyperviscosity. And sometimes doctors can cause hyperviscosity to occur in their WM patients. We have to be very, very, very careful about that. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay. Is this you yet, Megan, or is this still me? It's still you. Okay. Anyway, so uh, 
how does WM make too much protein? What happens is, as Megan told you, you have these lymphoplasmacytic cells, these WM cells, they make the IgM, the IgM accumulates in your bloodstream, and you can measure that with what's called the immunoglobulin test, and then, uh, and then there's a test called electrophoresis and M protein spike that all of you need to know and be aware of for your particular disease. And what Megan talked about, just to emphasize this again, is that most of our monoclonal antibody, most of our antibodies in our blood, they're called immunoglobulins, like IgA or, I, or IgEG, occur all by themselves as one. But in Waldenstrom's, five of them stick together at once. It's a very, very large protein. So if you get a lot of that protein in your blood, that's what makes it not flow very well, makes it too viscous. So this, don't look at the guy's tongue. Okay, so I should, I, I, I looked at this yesterday, I said, oh, I should have left the guy's tongue out. These are very, so hyperviscosity and amyloidosis are rare complications of amyloid. And does anyone here, in here have amyloidosis in addition to their WM? Usually there's a few. And, 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 and the answer is, yes, some of you do, but no one knows it yet. That's the correct answer. Because if you look really, really hard for amyloid in WM patients, you sometimes can find it. What's amyloid? Remember when Megan showed you the picture of those antibodies? They have a heavy chain and a light chain. So what amyloid is, is when that light chain, which is called kappa or lambda, is screwed up. And it's so screwed up that when the body is trying to deal with it, it turns into a very stick toxic protein called amyloid. And amyloid can cause a host of other problems. Uh, it can go uh, infiltrate the tongue or the throat or the kidney or the heart or the nerves or the liver or the spleen and cause all kinds of things. So uh, when people have WM, the back of our minds, we always go, make sure they don't have amyloidosis. Uh, but unfortunately, that's quite rare. Uh, hyperviscosity is when, uh, again, there's so much IgM in the blood that it makes the blood thick. And there's a, actually, actually a test called serum viscosity, and perhaps many of you have had that done. And this, in the serum viscosity, this is one of those things where there's an abnormal range, where we, this is the normal range here, 1.4 to 1.8. And typically we sort of think about it when that viscosity goes above four. But viscosity in our hands is not so much a laboratory diagnosis as it is talking to your patient and see if your patient is demonstrating any signs or symptoms of hyperviscosity. So what I mean by that is, uh, we always say this all the time, when all else fails, talk to your patient. That's one of our expressions in our practice, because you can get really fixated on the numbers, right, when you have uh, WM. What's my IgM? What's my M spike? What's my viscosity, et cetera, et cetera. But when people ask me about viscosity, when I say, well, tell me how you're doing, and I'll tell you if there's hyperviscosity. So hyperviscosity symptoms are, again, headaches, visual disturbances, nosebleeds, not feeling well, confusion, shortness of breath, that kind of thing. Fortunately, fortunately again, quite rare. So what is viscosity? Viscosity is something that measures the resistance of fluid to flow, and water flows uh, uh, readily. It's less viscous, so we call that thin, and oil flows less readily. The 40-weight motor oil we talked about before, that makes it thick, and IgM can make it thick. So there's a procedure that we sometimes do when people have hyperviscosity called plasmapheresis, okay? Plasmapheresis. And this is uh, from a re review for, uh, from a WM conference. And we'll just read this together. So, so and let me explain what plasmapheresis is. Has anyone here undergone plasmapheresis in the room? Several people, wow. So plasmapheresis is a technique where we use a machine that looks like a dialysis machine you put uh, an IV in each on one of two, two arms of the patient where they get a big garden hose IV up near the neck or collarbone. And then they sit for three or four hours in a lazy boy recliner next to a machine that processes the blood on this machine continuously. And every time the blood passes through the machine, the machine tries to remove the excess IgM protein. And so what it does is, is that it removes the protein in the blood. It doesn't address the production of the protein from the bone marrow but it removes it, so it's a temporary fix. So plasmapheresis is a temporary fix for alleviating symptoms of hyperviscosity, but it's not a permanent fix at all. I've had patients ask us before, hey, if I, can we just do plasmapheresis to manage my disease that way so I don't have to take chemotherapy? No. And so plasmapheresis is a temporary fix. So the use of plasmapheresis should be reserved for the treatment of symptomatic hyperviscosity, not a number. Not a number, but symptomatic hyperviscosity. 
and for the treatment of certain complications of WM, such as neuropathies or light chain kidney disease. In such circumstances, phosphophoresis should be regarded as an interim therapy until definitive therapy can be initiated and shown to control the disease. There's an exception to this that we learned since 2003. And the exception is there are some people who don't have hyperviscosity, but if we give them a drug called rituxan or rituximab, we can sometimes cause hyperviscosity. That's called rituxan flare, okay? And so, and that occurs when we're gonna start rituxan, which is a, a, a very common, commonly utilized treatment in WM, and the IgM's already 4,000, 5,000 or higher. And so if you have an IgM of 5,000, and I'm gonna give you rituxan, there's a chance I can make your IgM in that first month 7,000 or 8,000 or 10,000. If you didn't have hyperviscosity before, I can cause it. So in those patients, will very commonly do a preventative plasmapheresis, one or two or three of those, before initiating the rituxan therapy. So sometimes we use it preventatively. Okay, so let's talk about prognosis. So this is something that, that when, when we go to our WM meetings for the doctors, and they're in, they're in horrible places too, uh, but uh, this year's is in Amsterdam. Uh, anyway, uh, there's always a, some talk addressing prognosis. And here's a prognosis slide right here. So, and look at the title of my slide, okay? So, prognosis, don't pay attention to anything that you read, okay? So people have tried to figure out how, why some people with WM do better than other people who have WM. And they've developed all these factors for looking at that. But I have to say that in our practice, in our career, we don't think this is germane at all. And other, other physicians may disagree and discuss it, but people always try to look up, say, what's, so doc, what's, what's it look like, doc? How long am I gonna live? How, you know, that kind of stuff. And the cool thing will be probably later in the meeting when we see people that are here for the relapse talks, other talks, you're gonna find people who, who ignored this as well, the, the, the veterans, right, who, who didn't look at this. So um, there's things that we, there's stuff published out there, I don't look at it. You can if you want, but I don't. Now we're going to turn it back to Megan. So when, whenever you go to the doctor, and we notice this in our patients, they get their labs drawn, maybe they get them done the week before, they get them done at the visit, and then we walk in the room and the first question the patient wants to know is, what do my labs show? What are my numbers? And one thing that I think we want to impart on you today is, well, a couple of things. One is, like Dr. Mattis said, when all else fails, we listen to the patient. So there are times when we'll say, let's talk about how you're doing first. Let's ask how you're feeling first, and then we'll talk about the labs. Because we, can, we, we check those numbers, and we all know that the patients check those numbers, but in the end, asking you how you feel is as or more important than looking at the labs. Having said that, though, I think it's important to understand the lab work so that if something happened to your family member who understands the lab work or happens to your doctor who's the one who was the keeper of the lab work that you know what those numbers mean and you can explain them to your family or if you have ever had to go to a different physician maybe you could explain it to that physician who may not understand or know anything about WM. So we look at blood tests, we look at urine tests, we already talked about doing the bone marrow biopsy and occasionally we have to do a CAT scan and that's to evaluate for swollen lymph nodes or to evaluate if a spleen is swollen. So I think there's probably five main labs that we check um, when we see our patients. And the first one is the complete blood count. And that's the test that measures the white cells, the red cells, and the platelets. So if we go back to the garden analogy, if you have your bone marrow and normally you're supposed to have you know, a, a certain balance of all those cells in there, I kind of think of that as a garden that has its, the flowers that are supposed to be there. But when you get WM or another type of a blood cancer, then I think of it like a weed. So you have this weed that's growing that shouldn't be there. And a lot of times it crowds out space, it crowds out nutrients. And so normal cells, normal flowers can't grow in the numbers that they should. So people can develop anemia, that's probably one of the most common abnormal um, CBC findings, or their platelets might drop, 
um, or their good normal white blood cells might drop. We also check a blood chemistry. Um, that doesn't change as frequently in patients with WM, but we always look at your kidney function, your liver function, your other electrolytes. And then there's also a test um, on that evaluation called a total protein, which is sort of another way, a rudimentary way of measuring the, the IgM protein in sort of a bigger scale. It's not as sensitive, but it can give us some idea if the WM protein is going up. We talked about the quantitative immunoglobulin test. That's the one that measures the absolute number of IgA, IgM, and IgG. So you have to remember that we all make these immunoglobulins. They're a normal part of the immune system. So when you're looking at just an absolute number, you're measuring some normal immunoglobulins, and then you're me measuring the clonal immunoglobulins, which are the ones made by the WM cells. So in order to... Um, Go to the next slide. In order to sort of get, get at which of those proteins are the trouble proteins and which ones are the normal proteins, we can do this test called an M-spike. I'm sorry, an S-PEP, which measures the M-spike. And what this shows is it's, it's a test that takes all the protein in the body and then graphs it out so that we can evaluate if, is it the normal distribution of proteins or abnormal. So the most abundant protein in the body is albumin. It's about 50% of all the protein. And then as the proteins go on, there's the alpha and the gamma. And then over here in this region, this is where the IgM protein would hide or would show up on this SPEP test. So if you have sort of a bunch of different types of proteins in the body, which is what you should have if you just have a normal immune system with normal immune immunoglobulin production, you kind of have this flat plateau in the gamma region. When you have MGUS or WM or multiple myeloma or another blood cancer that produces these clonal proteins, you get this spike called an M spike. And basically what that shows is that all of these proteins in this region look very similar or look identical to each other. So instead of it being that sort of heterogeneous um, wide plateau, you get this peak or spike. And that, this, this spike can be measured. So we refer to this as the M spike or the M protein. And it basically calculates which of the IgM proteins are the clonal proteins. So let's say, for example, your IgM number is 4,000. And your M spike test is 3.0, or 3. Point, let's say 3.5. If you take that 3.5 and multiply it by 1,000, you get 3,500. And if your total, M, your total IgM is 4,000 and you subtract the two, so 4,000 minus 3,500, you can say of the 4,000, around 3,500 of those IgMs are from the WM, and the other 500 are just the normal IgM that your body was making. Does that make sense? So patients will ask, which one matters the most? Which one do you pay attention the most? pay attention to the most. And we, we look at all of these together. So they usually ebb and flow together. As the IgM goes up, the M spike will go up. As the IgM goes down, the M spike will go down. But one thing you have to remember about this test, and we always caution our patients with all these numbers, is we never look at just one number. So we look at trends in the numbers. Because you can have, if you had an infection, or if um, when this uh, test was evaluated by the person doing the interpretation. You know, somebody measured this at 3.5 and the next person measured it at 3.3. There's going to be some variability in the results. So we don't, you know, hang our hats on just one evaluation. We look at the trend over time. But as I said, more, most importantly, we ask you how you're doing. This test is um, less important in evaluating WM, but it's still a test that we measure and evaluate, and it's, it evaluates the free light chain assay. So as Dr. Mattis mentioned, um, this is the immunoglobulin protein. This little piece on the side is the light chain. The names are kappa and lambda. And this protein itself is kind of dynamic. Sometimes it's together in one piece. Other time, times the heavy chain and light chain are separated. So you can measure the light chain when it's not attached to the heavy chain. In, in this case, again, it's one of those numbers you measure with the IgM and the M spike, but it's just another piece of the puzzle. So you don't base any treatment decisions on 
just the free light chains or just the IgM. You take it all, um, take it all together. We talked about the chemistry, which is the blood test that measures the kidney function and liver function. And I kind of hit on the CBC at the very beginning as far as just measuring um, and specifically looking for anemia. I do want to say that um, how many of you are, have heard of or are familiar with something called von Willebrand's disease? A couple of people. So von, Willebr von Willebrand's disease is a bleeding disorder that can be hereditary. People can be born with it. It can be passed down in families. But it can also be acquired. And patients with WM can have an acquired von Willebrand's disease, which means that um, you have an easier chance of bleeding, especially during procedures, so dental procedures or surgeries. So it's, it's definitely important if you were to have, you know, be, be needing a major surgery or going forward with something like that, that you, there's, there are blood tests that can be done to check to make sure you don't have acquired von Willebrand's so that you would be safe during this, the surgical procedure. I'll let Dr. Mattis finish on treatment. So treatment, Dr. Castillo is going to talk about treatment uh, this early this afternoon, I think, Carl, one of the, Jorge Castillo from Boston, and he'll do a great job talking about it. I'll just, I'll just address it very, very briefly. So WM doctors uh, do agree on when treatment should be initiated. So the most common second opinion that we see in Colorado is when a patient has been diagnosed with WM, and they are completely without symptoms, and, but their IgM number is really high, and their doctor has recommended treatment because the IgM level is so high. That by far and away is the most common second opinion that we see. And we say, well, the IgM by itself is not an indication to treat WM. When we treat WM is when there are problems. What are those problems? Uh, if you're anemic, so if you have anemia or a low platelet count, that would be a reason to treat. If you're having symptoms, when we talked about symptoms, fatigue, sweats, uh, unintentional weight loss, ears turn purple, fingers turn purple when you go outside, uh, lymph nodes are too big, uh, that kind of stuff. Those are symptoms that would make us treat. Symptomatic hyperviscosity, not just the number, but symptoms. Moderate to severe neuropathy, and that's the purple stuff we talked about. So this is when we treat WM. We don't treat the number, we treat for symptoms. And, and what's important also to know is that the level of IgM and or the percentage of cells in the bone marrow varies tremendously between WM patients. And some patients have very low IgM levels uh, with lots of symptoms. And other people have very high IgM level, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, with no symptoms. And so this is, again, gets back to, you know, doc, what, what am I supposed to, you know, do I need to have treatment? How am I doing this? And the doc says, tell me how you're doing, and I'll tell you what we need to do. So, and this is a very elegant paper that, that Steve published several years ago here. I'm going to walk you through it because it's a little bit tough to see. So this, these are three graphs here. And on, on the left here, this, show, this is the IgM level here. And you see up here we're in the 8, 10, 12, 14,000 range. This is 2,000 down here. And this is the percent of, of, my, of uh, WM cells in the bone marrow. So the point I want to make is you can have a bone marrow that nearly, nearly is completely replaced with WM cells and have an IgM of 800, OK? Or conversely, you can have over here uh, very few WM cells in your bone marrow, maybe 10 or 20 percent, with an IgM of 4,000, 6,000, or 8,000. And this varies tremendously between patients, so it's not it's not linear. So that's really important to keep in mind. The next the next panel here shows the red blood count, which is measured as hematocrit based on bone marrow involvement. So some people who have a completely packed bone marrow with WM cells can have, a, this is 40% is pretty darn normal here, a pretty normal red blood count. Conversely, you can have very few WM cells in your, uh, in your bone marrow, yet have, uh, have a lot of anemia. So it's really, it, it's, a, it's a very, it's a heterogeneous disease. It's not, you have to think about it. The bottom panel, the, what the bottom panel looks, looks at is your red blood count based on your IgM level. And here there's kind of a trend that the higher your IgM level, the lower your red blood count. But again, you can have some, someone here who's got an IgM of 2,000 with a very normal hematocrit, and the same person with an IgM of 2,000 in the next room has a hematocrit of 25% and has symptomatic anemia. So that's why you, you, we don't treat 
the numbers don't determine how we treat WM, it's what the patient tells us. So this is the coolest thing about uh, WM in the last several years is that now WM is a real disease. It's a real boy. Uh, and so what, what, what we mean by that is that in, in cancer, if there are recurring changes in the DNA in the chromosomes inside the cancer cells that we see in, in a certain type of uh, condition, then that, that's a real distinct disease on itself. Remember we talked about the WM, some doctors used to wonder if it's really any different than marginal so on, if it's just a variation of that. Well, WM is a real disease because it has a real mutation. So there's a DNA change in, in a gene called MYD88, and this is the name of the DNA change here, that occurs in virtually every individual with, with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and not very often in people who do not have Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. So this is a big deal. And Dr. Castillo is going to talk about that this morning, when he talk, or this afternoon when he talks about treatment, because when we understand the guts of a, of a lymphoma, the guts of a cancer, understand how the DNA screwed up in a particular cancer, then that leads to better understanding, better treatment. And that's absolutely the case in WM. So uh, very briefly, should all patients be treat, tested for MYD88? That's this mutation that occurs. Uh, it's kind of a recommendation, but I have to say sometimes I don't think I need it in order to know if somebody's got WM or not. Uh, and, and there's an additional mutation called CXCR4. Has anybody been tested for CXCR4 here in the room? Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later as the day goes on as well. So the, the, the day, all those tests we talked about initially for treating, for testing for WM bone marrow biopsies, immunoglobulins, M spikes and stuff, I think that there's a tremendous momentum and the standard of care is changing to include uh, these molecular tests. And I think in a few years, they'll be quite standard to test both for MYD88 and for CXCR4. Okay, so at this point, uh, we try to leave a lot of room for questions because at the first time recession, uh, hopefully people have a lot of questions. And, 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 and for those of you who are maybe think, I, have, I don't have, my question's kind of stupid, I don't want to ask my question. I would take bets that 10 of the people in the room have the exact same question on their minds, and so every question is a good question. Ask them and let's make this very interactive. Thank you. Hi, you mentioned uh, clotting abnormalities. Talk a little bit more about that. Go ahead. Okay, so, so in, in WM, there's a, uh, there are different reasons why WM patients can uh, bleed or bruise. Number one is probably hyperviscosity. So when, you're, when your blood is really thick, the, uh, the, the, there's a tendency to have bleeding in that setting. So typically nose bleeds or gum bleeds. But this thing called acquired von Willebrand's that Megan talked about is also a reason why people with WM can bleed, bleed more often. Von, uh, acquired von Willebrand's is a, is a little bit like hemophilia, which most people have heard about. Uh, and, so, uh, and, and so we have people with WM, for example, who have a procedure done and bleed like a stuck pig, uh, and that's usually from acquired von Willebrand's. The last reason why people can bleed with WM is if it makes your blood platelets. Platelets are your blood clotting cells. And for people who have a lot of WM, uh, sometimes their platelet count gets very low, and they can bleed for that reason as well. We don't see people who have excessively thick blood really with WM. If they do have a thick blood or a blood clotting condition, like too many blood clots, that's typically not related to the WM. But there are at least three different reasons why people with WM may have a tendency to bleed more than others. Not a common complication, but it happens. Uh, excuse me. One of your slides had a reference to something called leukopenia. Can you explain what that is and how it affects how the patient feels? So leukopenia is the medical word for a low white blood cell count. So generally speaking, a low white count wouldn't make you feel bad, although I definitely have people who, when their white counts are low, correlate that with feeling less well, and I don't know if that's because they're feeling less well because the WM is more active, or maybe their white count's low because they just had chemotherapy and they're not well from the chemotherapy. But generally speaking, a low white count in and of itself does not, would not make you feel unwell. It may increase your risk of an infection, especially if the neutrophil count was low. The neutrophils are the good infection-fighting type of white blood cell, but in and of itself shouldn't make you feel bad. Doctors, doctors, doctors are very good at causing leukopenia. 
So we, we cause leukopenia with some of our chemotherapies. We cause low white count with that sometimes. Thank you. If we're treating um, the symptoms, not so much the numbers, why can't you use plasmapheresis as the sole treatment uh, as long as it's working and the only uh, real issue is the viscosity? Great question. You're not the first person ever to ask that question either. So, because plasmapheresis is not chemotherapy. So, every person on the planet with a cancer wants their doctor to treat them without chemotherapy, right? That, that's just that's what they, everyone wants. So, plasmapheresis is a quick fix. And so, what happens is you have and you have this this bone marrow full of WM cells that's churning out IgM. And then you can skim off IgM with plasmapheresis. But as soon as you quit doing that, after a few weeks usually, the IgM is built up again, and you'd have to do this repetitively. And plasmapheresis is not without risk. Every time you uh, stick an IV in someone or have to put a catheter in them, there's a chance something bad could happen. So it's just not feasible to do. It's, it's, it's a kind of, it's a laborious procedure, it, it has some risk, it has expense associated with it, and, it, and it's not durable in the least, it's just not a feasible way to manage a disease uh, in a, on a long term. So none of us really do it. There's no home plasma phoresis kit uh, that can be done, and so it, it is a, it's, a, uh, it's a quick symptom fix while you're addressing the underlying problem. It's just not feasible. But do you risk progression of the disease at a faster rate if that's what you are doing? No, not at all. Not at all. You just you spin, you spin your wheels a little bit, but you don't risk worsening of your disease. I have a question about the issues of the genetic markers. Uh -huh. oh, uh, uh, if you've had a, a you're, you're clear, clearly diagnosed through a uh, biopsy that you have all the instruments, uh, but the results come back that the the uh, genetic genetic markers are not present, which, as you said, virtually all all the yeah. patients have the marker. Yeah. So, is is that something that you should pursue, or just don't worry about? So, are you speaking about MYD88? Yeah, and, and the CR and CSCR4. So, M so MYD88. Uh, when you look at all, I think I have a slide on this, and I'm sure you'll see it. 10, 12 times during the meeting. In my afternoon session, I have a slide on this. But the, uh, it's, it's not, there are people with WM who do not have a mutated or abnormal MYD88. And so there are exceptions to every you know, generalization that we make. But if you have LPL uh, in your bone marrow, the lymphoma cells, and, and an IgM, that's the criterion for making a diagnosis of, of Waldenstrom's. Right. So clearly, there are other um, there's probably something else, some other mutation going on that we haven't quite identified that is driving that. Uh, so there are different paths to get to WM besides MYD88. So it may affect treatment decisions. Now CXCR4 is less commonly mutated than MYD88 in Waldenstrom. So if it looks like a duck, we still call it a duck. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I would like you to clarify uh, the term percent of bone marrow involvement. Okay. I was listening to a doctor and it sounded like he takes that into consideration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we, we we like to quantify things, right? We, we just like to count. Right? And, that, and so in the bone marrow, remember Megan talked about all those, that one slide way back, blood cell development, stem cells, red cells, platelets, white cells, all those things. So normally there's a nice mix of those in the bone marrow. So the bone marrow's got fat, because every, every, whenever we've broken a chicken bone, you see the yellow stuff come out, that's fat, and it's got cells. And as we get more lymphoma, there's less fat and more cells. Then when you look at the cells, normally there's a nice mix of the red cells and the white cells and the platelets and everything. And then, but what we look at is there are the cells there, how many of those cells are LPL? And that's the percentage. So if you have, let's just say of your bone marrow, 40% is fat, 60% is cells. Of the 60%, what percent of that is lymphoma? That's called cellularity. And so let's just say, so if half of the cells that we see in the bone marrow are LPL cells, we call that 50% involvement by lymphoma. 
Uh, and if it's 10%, it's 10%, if it's 80%, it's 80%. So it's counting the percent of all the cells in the bone marrow that are WM cells. That's what that, ref that's what that refers to. And, 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 and this is tricky, because we have some treatments that make people feel a lot better when we treat them for WM, but the percent of abnormal bone marrow cells changes very little. You can hear about that later. Over time so, it changes little? Sometimes, yeah. And so, it's, it's, so the, the percent plasma, the percent WM cells in the marrow is something that we look at. But again, when you're assessing a patient with WM, the most important thing is how do you feel? The next most important thing is let's look at everything that we can measure and look at it all together to decide how effective our treatment has been. IgM, SPEP, um, anemia, percent, you know, percent WM cells in the marrow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But just, it's just one of those, it's just counting them. Just quickly back to the percentages, I just wanted to ask a question of how often do you find uh, someone in their bone marrow uh, biopsy have more than WM in terms of cancers? Because when mine was done, um, initially I was told I had features of two cancers, and then within a year, it was another bone barrel biopsy, and those same two cancers exist, but in different percentages. So in my case, uh, in the bone marrow biopsy from last year, uh, I was told to have 60% in LPL, uh -huh. the WM, and 20% of CLL. Now is that something you find often is two cancers? No. Uh, often, no. But does it occur? Yes. And so as, as we live longer, we have a higher chance of getting blood cancers. And CLL is the most common B cell blood cancer by far, okay, by far. Uh, and, uh, and WM, of course, is less common. Now, are they related in the same individual? Is it somehow is the same cells screw up and one, you know, a cousin turned into CLL and another cousin turned into WM? I don't know that, uh, but but it's not it's not common, but it absolutely happens. So we have patients with myeloma in CLL, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, other non-Hodgkin lymphoma in WM. We absolutely see that. The one thing we have to, we didn't mention today that we always are on the lookout for is sometimes WM, which, which is usually a slow-growing lymphoma, can morph or transform into a more aggressive kind of lymphoma. So we've seen that also. Uh, but so what you have is. Common, no, seen, yes. Yes, Dr. Mattis, um, I have a question that's probably on the mind of a lot of people who've been newly diagnosed with Wallenstrom's, particularly if they have children. And do you suggest or recommend that they have their children tested for MGUS or as the genetic testing becomes more common? If they should have their children tested for MYD88 or some of the other mutations? That, that, that's a great question, Sue, and a very common question. Our, our response is, all, all I would do is inform and talk to your kids that you have a blood cancer, but nothing beyond that. There's no routine testing that's done. They shouldn't have SPEPs or M spikes done or any of those things. And I just say that when your doc, if your son or daughter or your sibling is going to the doctor, for another reason, just mention, oh, by the way, I do have a, a relative or my mom or my dad has WM, and that way the doctor might just look a little more carefully at that complete blood count, a little more carefully at that total protein level on the chemistry test, but I do not recommend any testing uh, to screen for uh, WM in first degree relatives. Uh, it, it's, it's fraught with a lot of issues if you do that most of which we don't know what to do with the information. Hi, uh, can you explain the difference between cryoglobulinemia and cold agglutinin disease, and what are the implications for someone having both of them? Yeah, yeah they're, they're slightly different. So, so cryoglobulins are very specific proteins. They can be IgG, or they're usually uh, uh, IgM disease, and cryoglobulins are the uh, uh, diseases that can cause, for example, uh, kidney irritation, uh, or uh, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it can inflame certain organs by doing that. Cold agglutinin disease is the one that mostly 
is, is the one that we would go outside, our fingers and the hands turn purple, and it's a slightly different uh, accumulation of abnormal proteins that does that. Uh, can people have both at the same time? Absolutely they can. Uh, are there different tests for each of them? Yes, there are different tests for each of them. And what was your last question? Uh, what are the implications of having both? Uh, you need to have your IgM treated. <laughs> your WWM treated. So it's, it's, they, off, they often go hand in hand. And so uh, it's not worse or better or anything. It, it makes it easier to know when to treat you. You know, that's for sure. Hey guys, great presentation. Um, I just had a question. You both really drove home the idea that numbers are not everything and that you should really look at symptoms before treatment. My question is, is there an upper limit to that? Like say your IgM is like 10,000 and your bone marrow involvement is like, you know, 50% or 60% or something, but you're not getting really extreme symptoms. I mean, is there some type of upper limit? that you would put on that? <laughs> there, there isn't an upper limit. So I remember being here eight or nine years ago and there was a like a 10,000 club, I think it was called. And there were every people who had an IgM of more than 10,000 or around 10,000 sort of had that notated somewhere, I think, on their badge, if I remember correctly, if I'm not making that up. Is that true? So, yeah, they, they, they did do that. But I, I think it, it all, as that one slide pointed out, the one that had the three different um, graphs, you can have an IgM of 10,000 or 11,000 and have a normal red count, no symptoms, feel like a million bucks. And you would still, still say hold off treatment? Absolutely, yep. Yeah. We have patients that have an IgM of 300 and they're, they don't feel well at all, they're very fatigued, they're anemic. So the IgM really doesn't correlate at all with the patient's symptoms and the absolute number only matters if, if it's making you ill in other ways. Do you see a correlation with the numbers and the efficacy of treatment? Like say a symptomatic 10,000 IgM patient is more receptive to the treatment than a 300? No, no, the, the, one of the answers is, is there a reason to intervene earlier in somebody because the treatment might work better? No. I, I will say when a person walks in, you've seen them for the first time, their IgM is 9,500 or 10,000 and you're talking to them and you and in your mind you're, you're digging you're digging for symptoms but you can't find them i will bring that patient back a little bit more uh for the first you know year or two uh to, to really really make sure they're not having symptoms okay gotcha yeah yeah and just one last follow-up question is there some type of association association that you see with certain risk factors based on those numbers at least that you know, at this at this range, yeah. the risk for this and this and this goes up, and at this range, the risk. Well, hyper hyperviscosity would be the major one. Okay. Hyperviscosity is the major one that we look for as the IgM levels get higher. But is there? You saw this slide where it doesn't it correlates a little bit with anemia, right? A tiny bit with anemia, but not necessarily not necessarily with other things. It's the it's not just the quantity of the IgM protein; it's the quality of the IgM protein, right? There's more to it than just counting them. Has to, has to do with the nature of the WM cell, the nature of the IgM protein. You can have a small IgM protein that can cause severe peripheral neuropathy in a patient. I mean like painful, <clears throat> painful peripheral neuropathy and their IgM is 400. Due to the size of the IgM the protein? The quality of the IgM. It's the, it's the nature of that IgM protein, that particular IgM protein. It's the, and we, don't, we can't test for that. I can't do a test that says, how wicked are you IgM protein? We don't have that test. There, is there really no test at all no, for no. like testing the quality of the IgM protein? Yeah, you have to ask the smart doctors like Dr. Ansel or Dr. Treon or Dr. Castillo that later, but I'm not aware of any. Okay, yeah. cool. Thanks, guys. My wife was diagnosed in, 20, in 2012, and obviously she had symptoms of fatigue, and that discovery was a result of a subtle variation in a, in a regular blood test done by her physician, and then she saw the oncologist. So my question is, what's the incubation period of, of WM? How, how long before this was she ill? Because she does admit she didn't have a lot of energy to do housework and things like that before 2012, but she doesn't know if in fact that had anything to do with the diagnosis. So the only, this is a very common question and extremely difficult to answer. But what I often will ask patients to do is, do you go to health fairs? So have you had the same doctor for a while? Do you have your labs? And you can go back, if you can pull your labs from 
years ago. And what you look at, like Megan said, is a total protein level, because no one, on the chemistry test, no one was doing an SPEP or an M spike, right? No one did a bone marrow biopsy on your wife in 2004. And so, but, but somebody may have drawn a chemistry lab at a health fair or an insurance physical or something else. And sometimes you can pull those old lab tests and you'll see that total protein creeping up over the years. And then you can go back and say, aha, they must have had a clonal IgM at that time. Also, we realize that for these blood cancers, and we don't have Dr. Gobriel coming this year from Boston, but Dr. Gobriel is a fantastic physician and researcher. And her whole research is, is based on what's called precursor disease. So the more we learn about these diseases like myeloma or Waldenstrom's, the more we learn that they develop that virtually all of them out of MGUS. And MGUS can sometimes be present for decades before we have symptomatic disease. And so in the answer to your wife's question, uh, it's probably many, many, many years ago she started the first spark for having this problem, probably as MGUS, and then her WM probably occurred over five or 10 years before she was diagnosed minimum. Usually it's a very long period of time. It's a slow growing lymphoma in most individuals. Thank you very much. Oh, hi. Is the bone marrow transplant a viable treatment for WM? Yeah, so, so, when, so bone marrow transplant, and Dr. Castillo may touch on this, I don't know. A, a better, so when we talk about bone marrow transplants, there are two types that are done. One's from donors, that's called an allo. One's when you use your own cells, that's called an auto. And so auto is virtually the only type of transplant that's, that's performed in WM. It can be a very, very effective treatment for WM. The good news is hardly anybody requires it because the, 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 uh, our normal treatments are so good that hardly anybody requires what's called autologous bone marrow transplant. But if you do, it can be a very effective treatment and we occasionally do them. Okay, I got a question for us women in the room. How can menopause interfere with treatment or vice versa? Or how is this IgM, or not the IgM disease, WM maybe make menopause worse or treatment available? Or any, any studies on all those things? If patients ask me this, I say ask Megan at, at your next visit with <laughs> Megan. So Megan? So, so I, I don't know of any way that the WM itself or the IgM protein would affect hormones or would affect menopause. I would say the chemo, that chemotherapy can affect it. So if you're still having a period and you take certain types of chemotherapy, it can either temporarily or permanently shut down ovarian function and then the hormone levels would drop and you could have early menopause. So I can see the chemotherapy affecting it, but not the disease itself. I think one of the more confusing, maybe not confusing, but one thing to take into consideration with hormone changes is people do have hot, hot flashes and night sweats and so when you're trying to sort out whether or not you're having a night sweat from the WM, versus hot flashes and night sweats from the menopause, that can sometimes be a little confusing as far as determining if you need to be treated. But it's not that it's, it's not that WM is causing or changing the hormone levels. Yep. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, back to your discussion of precursors. I'm just wondering if in your uh, clinical practice you have anything to say about people who had CFIDs in, in retrospect it's clear that so much of what I was dealing with, swollen lymph nodes and crushing fatigue, could have been Wallenstrom's and, and you know, possibly even delayed diagnosis and so you know I'm not asking yeah. you know how long before was it actually Wallenstrom's who knows I'll never know but I'm just wondering if in your clinical experience there's anything that works better for people who've had that experience that you've noticed or so. there has been some talk about rituximab being useful for people with CFITS and it's like okay you know I, it's not like how do I know to see if it's still there now that I'm dealing with the bone stress? Sure. So if a patient tells us, looking back, I know I had this four, five, eight, ten years ago, does that affect uh, their prognosis? Well, since it's a slow-growing one, right? You already outlived the predicted survival that our gentleman here heard in 1989. 
but uh, the, the honest answer is uh, it really doesn't come into play for me in deciding what treatment we choose for that patient or anything else. It's, it's pretty common in fact to hear something like that. Carl? Okay, so what I'm going to do now is ask everyone to give them a round of applause.